This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Tick Ticks. Buying tickets shouldn't be anonymous. We are built for fans, by fans. Available on Android and iOS. Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Here we are just after the halfway point of the 2016-2017 NHL season. And I'm back this week with my regular co-host, Matt. Matt, how you doing? Good. Uh, it was uh, a little bit different missing my first show out of the first 135, but back at it, ready to go. Props to Mike. He filled in for you well. We had some good discussion last week. Oh, that's good. I'm glad to hear that he had a good debut show on our Mike and I had a bit of a Versity Glove Fest while you weren't here. Yeah. That's good. So, um, you know, we're at the halfway point. This has been sort of a weird season for the Flames. If you look back at it, we started off the season rocky. This team started out, we were last in the league for a while. We thought this team might end up disappointing yet again and being a team that was really low in the West. And if you look at the team now, they're pushing for a spot at the top of the Pacific Division. And I think that if you look at why, this week of games is a great thing to look at. This is, I think, Calgary Flames hockey at its finest. Yeah. I, this team is kind of stuck in the middle still. Like, they, they have a lot of positive aspects, but there's still some holes in the team. And you can kind of see that based on where the Flames are in the standings, being one of the two wildcard teams. Yeah, and okay, when I say that it's fine, so I don't mean they've played great games all week, but they've had a good week overall. Yeah, oh yeah, that, I know. So why don't we take a look at those? The first one of the week was a game that I think we all were expecting the Flames to win. This was the game against the Colorado Avalanche. The Avalanche are fading fast. This is a team that is quickly dying in the stats, and last time we played them in Colorado, we won 6-3. to three. And the Flames end up winning this game four to one. Um, I don't really, I don't have a lot we can say about Colorado in this one, but I thought that the the Avalanche broke down. They made a lot of sloppy mistakes. Uh, they made a lot of mistakes in general, and the Flames were able to capitalize on that. I thought the power plays both looked really good and moved the puck really well, which was easy against Colorado. And Matt, um, I don't know how much of this game you watch, but this, I think, might have been the most confident that we've seen Elliot. Yeah, the team played well. Anytime it, you're playing the worst team in the NHL, it's always difficult because you don't want to take them for granted because any NHL team can beat another. But on the other hand... Like, the Avalanche are terrible and in desperate need of dismantling pretty much everything about their their team currently. So, like, the Flames managed the game well and just did what they needed to do. Picker did well, I thought, and that was about the only Avalanche that I thought played well. Yeah, and I thought that really the thing that sealed this game for the Avalanche was their undisciplined play in the third that led to that two-man Flames power play uh, that Goudreau capitalized on. Yep, I agree. And the other thing, and I didn't count how many, but it seemed like there was a lot of odd man rushes in Calgary's favor. And again, not not surprising when you look at where the Avalanche are in the stats and standings and how they're playing, but just they were capitalizing a lot on... Um, you know, on the the mistakes that Colorado was making. I think if Colorado would have played a more disciplined game, this could have been a lot closer. But the, as you mentioned, they're kind of imploding from within. Mm-hmm. Now, I got a question for sure. you. At the trade deadline, if the deal, you can get Jerome Aginla, and it'll cost Emile Poirier, do you make that deal? No. Okay. Oh, yeah. To me, I don't think that at this point we should be leveraging our future. Uh, and we don't know what we have in Poirier really yet. I think that that's a, a bad deal for the Flames to take on an expiring contract, uh, an expensive expiring contract for uh, you know a young player like that. What do you think? I agree. I'm just tossing ideas. What if it was, say, like a third-round pick? 
instead? This year, no. I think the most I'd give up for Iggy would be a fourth oh. if we're giving up picks. I think that this team still needs a good draft year. And, I mean, again, has had a terrible season. I think that his price is going to be pretty cheap. But I also I, think... I'm he, just throwing things at, you know. Yeah, I also think, you know, I, as much as as a homer, I want him here. I think that he's going to end up being uh, Colorado or L.A. I think those will be his big destinations. Because I think that they are in cup contention. And yeah. we're not. And a guy like him is going to want to win that cup. I agree. So I don't see... I mean, I'd love to see him back as a Flames fan, but realistically, I don't think he's coming back. So I think the Flames rode a wave of confidence after that game that they took into Vancouver. And this is weird. This is a home-and-home back-to-back series. You don't see these too often. Uh, The first one of the week was in Vancouver against Vancouver. And this was a game that was... You see one or two of these every year. The Flames played the best game they could have. They... I think at no matter what stat you look at, they outplayed the Canucks. But somehow, um, Ryan Miller made 44 saves and ended up winning the game. And yeah, it was the first time since like 2000 that a team led by 33 shots and lost since like Ottawa in 2000, I think against Buffalo. So, yeah, it's one of those games that you should win, but, you know... And it's I can't even fault Elliot in this one because the goals that uh, the chances that Vancouver did get they were all full value. It's just unfortunately the Flames' defense was rather terrible in that game, and the Flames looked a little bit off all night. I mean, they played a better game, but just as a whole team, I thought that they looked a little off. I don't know what it was, but it just something didn't seem right. Maybe that's what it was. Maybe it's the defense. Yeah. Well, even if you extend it to the Winnipeg game on the night that we're recording, like it, just something seemed off in each of those games where like they're playing well, but it's just the passes aren't quite clicking or the good shots aren't quite clicking like they normally would. Not much you can do. It, stuff like that happens, as you said, once or twice a year. It sucks that we're on the losing end of it this you know, this week, but there'll be some other game where how did we get the two points and you just kind of skate off the ice happy as can be. It's just so... Everything tends to balance out. It's just frustrating when you're going through it on the losing end. And we've been on the other end. I mean, we've been on the side where the other team outplays us and somehow we managed to win. Yeah. And I can remember a few times in the last couple of years that's happened. So, you know, everything has to balance out, like you said, in the end. Um... But it's, I, I think that even though the Flames were off here, if they could play this sort of offensive game, this kind of structured, solid game that they played in Vancouver more often, um, I think that they would win a lot more games. Oh, for sure. Like If they played like that every game, they'd be right up there with Pittsburgh and all the other good teams. It's just... Vancouver's kind of terrible as well, so... Just like the Avalanche game, it's kind of hard to gauge exactly what this team is when, you know, you could, of course you can throw a great performance like that out, but you also have to look at the competition and they're not very good. Yeah. No, it's it's true. I mean, we've we've seen Vancouver kind of going downhill the last couple of years, and I think that right now they're probably the lowest we've seen them. Yeah. And like, yes, they're, they've been riding high. They've... The, their win against Calgary was their sixth in a row, but just like last year, the Flames had that long winning streak in December and then fell apart, and I'm expecting very much the same thing to happen to the Canucks. The interesting thing in this game, I did some stat tracking. The Flames had seven odd man rushes after two periods, so those are th- you know generally you're going to get good shots on them. Of the 46 shots the Flames took, there were probably 25 of them that were actually good on net shots. And interesting enough, the Flames scored on their first shot and their 45th shot. Sometimes you just get frustrating games like that, and it's hard to explain how you lose in a game like that, but it happens. And And you know what, though, (sighs) I guess, you know, it happens, but at the same time, I think that this this was an okay one for it to happen in. 
Yeah. Um, you know, we're not at a position where we needed those two points to keep our head above water. We're not at a point where this is going to cost us the playoffs. Like, you know, we got it over with. We moved on and we went back the next night and got our revenge. And I think that was the best part of all this. Yeah. And to get carry on with that, the last time I recorded, I said in the seven game segment ending with the second Vancouver game, that the very worst that the team could do and still consider them realistic playoff contenders was have a 5-2 and two record over that seven-game stretch. And with the win in the back-to-back, the Flames did fin- finish that set segment with a 5-2 and two record. So at least they passed that. They Yeah, they, they passed that that number and they're do, they're staying on pace for where they need to be. I mean, the win against the the Avalanche I think put them back at 500 hockey at home. Yeah. So they're definitely keeping their head above water. So to me, you know, it's heartbreaking cuz we played so well and it's a rival and you want to beat them, but in the end, I think, you know, if you look back at this season, this is going to not be a game we're going to remember as being anything major. No. And you also have to remember that in any season, you're going to lose about 25 games. You're going to win 25 games, and it's the remaining 30 that you have to worry about. So you're going to have games that you play well and you lose, or you play bad and you lose, and vice versa. So it is what it is. Yeah, no, for sure. And, you know, it's to me it's over, it's done, but the more interesting game was the next one when they came back to Calgary and played Vancouver. Um, a lot of people are saying, oh, Vancouver lost this one because they were shorthanded. There was a point there where they had four defensemen in the game, but, again, I think the Flames played just a better structured game in this one. It wasn't as good as the night before, but they played a more structured game. Yeah, I agree. Um, the game here in Calgary, I don't know if you knew this, but this was... Chad Johnson's first start since December 20th, and he hadn't won a game since the 10th of December. He struggled for a bit. Elliot played well, and that's what you need is two guys pushing each other. Yeah, no, you're right, Matt. And, you know, I think that's a good way of saying it is pushing, you know, one guy's pushing the other. And I've talked about that in the past. We saw always Kerry Ramo play well under that pressure. I've talked about that in other seasons. But I think that. With these guys, that's exactly what's happening. You know, Chad Johnson went in there, had some great games, had some really good wins, and then Elliot got the crease back, and they keep running with Elliot because he kept looking good. And then they put, they got to put Johnson back in at some point, especially on a back to back. And it's like, okay, now he's looking good again. So I think that we're in a really nice place where these guys can almost either play till you lose or play till you look like you're you need to be replaced. Yeah, and Johnson played well in both games that he appeared in so i'm expecting heading into the beginning of next week that he'll likely get more starts but he only allowed the one goal against vancouver and looked well throughout um like i was mentioning those canucks dressed 13 forwards and five defensemen for the game in calgary they went down to only four d-men for about half of the first period so sort of an interesting lineup there yeah, Furlan n- nailing Trampkin there. Mm-hmm. And also the interesting thing is the f- the Canucks had as many shots in the first period of this game as they did in the whole game the night before. Well, I'm sure that Willie Desjardins was saying, shoot the puck. Just Probably. Get it on net. Shoot it. Get it I close don't care. to the net. Yeah, I don't care. Just get it on net. <laughs> Put it close to the net. So the, the night ended up being uh, 31-29 for shots. In, in favor of Calgary. I think to me the the most interesting thing in this game that I think we'll look back on was that amazing Froelich goal, and that was one heck of a stretch pass from Kachuk. It looked like it went over two sticks, and that must have gone what seventy five feet. I know, like Canucks fans are probably wondering if Jewel Levy can ever do something like that. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, it's not something we're going to see all the time, but I think that also just kind of shows the the chemistry that we've seen developing on that line there, that those guys are comfortable with enough to be able to pull that kind of thing off. And that was a great goal. That's that's one that might make, like, a Flames highlight reel this year. Oh, for sure. And what a revelation Kachuk has been. Like, he's making his old man look bad. Like, in it, 
at the same point in their careers, uh, Matt has significantly more points in the same games played than his father did. Yeah, but, you know, I mean, Keith was never, I don't think Keith was ever looked at as a, and we talked about this a little bit last week, Keith was never really looked at a pinnacle NHL player. He was always sort of your, your I think, second line guy, more your, you know, depth scorer guy. Uh, I think Kachuk had over like four, 500 goals. So. He, he had a lot, but I don't ever remember any team building right around him. Like he always seemed to be the piece you got with somebody else. Yeah, he had 538 goals. So you're talking, you know, quality Hall of Fame caliber player. So, you know, he was a very good, especially in the Phoenix years for the Coyotes. And then later on with the Blues, that's when, like, when he was with the Blues the first go around, that's when he started becoming more of the second line type guy but he did score 50 goals a couple of times i mean but isn't mike gardner at about that level too well mike gardner is a little weird but i think he had like 700 and change goals yeah but i mean that's kind of the same thing right it's like i would not classify mike gardner as a guy you build an organization around no he is just uh, extremely consistent you you can just pencil the 30 goals in and just you know call it a day each year and that's what you want. You want that guy who's consistent as that, you know, depth scorer. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, no, you're right. Kachuk's been a great surprise. And I think that, you know, we talked about should he get sent back, should he go to the OHL. I think he's definitely proving that he should stay at the NHL. And what a, you know, what a good draft pick. Sometimes you're, you're not sure what you're going to get with the son of an NHLer. Um, but, you know, great pick. Yeah. And, you know, if the Flames do make the playoffs this year, maybe they can draft Cal Foote. Adam's son, and it, they're very much the same type of defenseman, so might be interesting. Yeah, I'm. I'm trying to think. So if we get foot, we have uh, Kachuk. We had. Didn't we have Ramage's kid for a while? Yeah. And I think those Reinhardt. Yeah. Reinhardt. Yeah. So we don't have many of the kids left anymore. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, we've had the Sons of the NHLers over the years, and I think that this is probably the best one that the Flames have had. And it's nice to see him developing that way. Oh, he doesn't look I like a 19-year-old either. No. He, you'd think he was 25, 26 when it, with the type of uh, moves and plays that he's making. But uh, at least the, the Flames organizationally, like, you now know Gaudreau's the first-line left wing, you now know Kachuk's the second-line left wing, you don't even have to argue or put in any dispute. Those guys are a awesome one-two punch. Perhaps one of the best one-two punches on the left side in the entire NHL. And they go about their game very differently, but they are extremely dangerous in their own way. For sure. And I think, like you said, the, we have the defined one and two guy. And I don't think that's ever going to change. I can't see a day when... Kachuk surpasses Goudreau. I think they both have a role on this team, and I think Goudreau's role is that flashy first-line sniper. Yeah, and the thing is, is that that allows you to get build two different lines that have completely different makeups, and that also factors in with like who you play with Goudreau, because like Monaghan is a good fit for him. And perhaps down the road you find somebody that... It can be more physical, like a Troy Brower. Not saying him, but you know what I mean. Like that type of guy on the right side for Kachuk to have more of like a physical two-way offensive, but will beat the crap out of you type of line. You know, and I know that he's on the wrong side, but a guy I could see fitting there well if he wasn't in Edmonton is Lucic. Yeah, something like that, yeah. Even though, I, even if, like, I don't personally think he has the offensive upside, but even a guy like Michael Furland, if you could throw him on the right side, that might be a good fit. But I, I don't think he has the offensive skill to merit that. But you know what I mean? like Yeah, we'll find that, that right winger, but you can't, you can't do it all right, you know, right away. And I think that'll be the big thing in the offseason is finding a right winger. Mm-hmm. 
Um, looking at looking... actually, uh, speaking of that, my number one trade target would be Gabriel Landeskog for exactly that role. Throw him on the right side with Kachuk. Have fun. Yeah, I've, that's I've read that Colorado costly. tends to overvalue their players, though, and it would cost a lot to get him out of there. Oh, I'm sure it would, but I don't know that. that I mean, that I agree would, that he that would nice be here. like the that would be like the perfect player that is theoretically available. Yeah, I for... agree. He'd look nice here. I just don't know that I'd want to pay anywhere near the price of what it probably. No, take. no, neither would I. You're probably looking at our first Shillington plus something else big, and yeah, no, no, not really. No, I don't think that we're close enough to needing to make such a deal where I'd even want to entertain it. You know, yeah. if, we're, if we're running for a cup, maybe, but I think yeah. we've all agreed this isn't a cup team this year. No, and you just got to play it by ear, see what exactly they're asking, and you never know. You might get a Hamilton situation, so... Yeah, I don't think you get anywhere near a Hamilton situation till the end of the season, though. Uh, no. But then again, I don't expect either Duchesne or Landeskog to get traded until the draft anyway. You could be right. I, I don't know. Colorado is going to be definitely be out of it by the deadline, so I could see them getting moved. Yeah. Well, I think what they'll end up doing is like getting rid of the Aginlas and other UFAs, anybody that's not strapped down, and then look for shake-up deals at the draft you know i'll, I'll call her right now i think that um joe sackick loses his job as gm this year i think oh get, i agree i think he'll get i mean he's an icon on that he's an icon on that team and they'll want to keep him around and i think they'll do something like sort of in toronto where he'll be like the almost the reverse of shanahan but he, yeah he'll kind of be the president of hockey operations like your brian burke here yeah, you know, it's like they've or got like uh, Edmonton when they move low out of the GM. Yeah, spot. exactly. So I, I see him in in that kind of a role, but I just I think that he's shaping up to be, um, just not be a good GM. And you know that's the thing. Just because you play the game, doesn't necessarily mean that you have the skills. Like Iserman's done a good job, but. But not everybody's How, going to. No, no. It's like coaches, right? I mean, we've seen some of the best coaches like, or some of the best players like Gretzky not be a great coach. And we've seen some of the players you wonder about, like Tim Hunter and guys like that, who were never great players who turn into really good coaches. Yeah. Well, like Maurice Richard, he coached for one day, said that these people know nothing and quit. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> it. not everybody is suited for particular jobs um, there you go they'll hire jerome next year as the coach he'll come in and be like crap i don't do it this you've got a full first line i'm out of here yeah <laughs> uh. yeah no i i think it's yeah i mean I, you know not trying to dwell on colorado too much but i i just think the major changes have to be made there and i think colorado and then the canucks are another organization that has to be, that has to make big changes yeah well, it, they have to just basically pull the plug. Like it, they're very long in the tooth. Like Colorado's been kind of in a rolling rebuild for a long time since they got Deshane in the first place, and it, they just been kind of waffling there. And like sometimes you just gotta rip the bandage off, admit that you're what's work, what you have isn't working, and then just start over. Well, and, and the Canucks are in an interesting spot, too, because if you look at it, I mean, who were the best players over the weekend? Granlin, definitely, and probably Berchi. Yeah. And if those are your best guys, that's kind of sad. And an interesting note, and I wanted your thoughts on it, too. The game here in Calgary, did you even notice the Sedins? Like, to me, they were non-existent. I didn't know them and I noticed them in either game. Like, honestly, if you weren't paying attention to the fact that it's Vancouver, it would be like, okay, yeah, those guys aren't playing. Like, so what are you talking about? Yeah, like after the the game in Calgary, I was kind of sitting there going, did the did the scenes play tonight? Like, I had to check the stats to see if they'd even played. Yeah, like honestly, I I if I was a GM of a team, I would not, even if I got them for a song, I don't think I'd trade for them. Like even if like Vancouver basically ate one of their contracts and. Like, I was able to dump some garbage back as well uh, I, for what they're doing. Like, when you're getting outplayed by Grandland and Berchi, like, come on. You're done. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
you know. Like, yeah, it, and, it is, and I think that you're going to have to take them both. And oh, for be, sure. That becomes a very expensive rental. Yeah. How long do they have left on their contract? I don't know. I'd have to check. They signed a huge deal. It's got to be two, three years. But uh, let's let's not dwell too much on other teams. Let's get back to Flames news. Uh, they their contracts are both up next year. Okay, so there you go. So maybe they'll end up getting moved at the end of next year. Yeah. So going back to the Flames after they beat the Canucks, the Flames went on a one game road trip to Winnipeg, probably the only place colder than Calgary on the on this earth right now. And they played against the Winnipeg Jets, the old school looking Winnipeg Jets. They wore their retro jerseys and. It was weird because the Jets were wearing their white at home, which meant the Flames wore their red at home. But, Matt, they squandered a perfect opportunity. Why did the Flames not bring their retro thirds? Like, that would have been perfect. Well, I remember when we played the Kings and they've had their purple or yellow jerseys. The Flames didn't go with their retros in those games either. So, I don't know if there's, like, some informal rule where if one team does retro that the other team can't. I don't know. But it would have made sense, wouldn't especially be, with the rivalry that the team had in the 80s and 90s. But Wouldn't it be cool to do like a retro series, though? Like, let's say, okay, this season, every time you play another Canadian team, you're going to go retro. Or, you know what, every Sunday game is going to be retro. Like it just well, well, that would be cool and fun, so you know that the NHL is not going to do that. <laughs> Batman would stop it. No, can't have that. But like, especially because too the much hun- fun there. Especially because the hundredth year. Like, let's let's throw back to some of the old times. Like, I can see almost any other league saying it's our hundredth birthday. Let's go all retro for a year, or let's go retro every Sunday, or every hockey Something. night in Canada's retro. Or like any original six team plays each other. You you dig through the closet of all the jerseys they've had and throw two together and have fun. Yeah, or even at hockey night in Canada. Anytime the Canadian teams play each other, go retro on it. And, yeah. you know, or I mean, even if a Canadian team's matching up against an American team, who cares? Like, throw a retro jersey in there. Like, say, like, St. Louis, their outdoor game jersey. Throw that in there anytime they're on Hockey Night in Canada. Like, that was an awesome jersey, by the way, for their outdoor game. Yeah, it was. And I heard that they're remaking some of the old Vancouver jerseys now, too, in limited quantities, which kind of scares me. Some of the old clown suits. Flying V, yay. <laughs> so, but anyway, um, talking about the actual game here in in Winnipeg, Flames played against the Jets and didn't have as much luck as they have. They really hit a hot Connor Hellebuck. And this game, I don't know what you thought of it, but I thought this was just a defensive game on both sides. I thought that both teams played a very conservative defensive game and nobody really took the burst of offense, I think, that they really needed to win. I thought Calgary was trying to be a little too fancy at times, trying to make that one extra pass when just shoot the puck. (laughs) You know, like especially if you're having difficulty getting goals past the guy, fire more pucks at him, maybe you might actually beat him. But it's just frustrating. Credit to Winnipeg, their defense did a good job of getting sticks in the way and bodies in the way. Yeah, I thought that they did a good job of clogging up the lanes for the Flames. They really shut down a lot of the Flames' zone entries and pushed them to the outside. And you're you're not going to score a lot of goals if you're always coming in on the outsides. Yep. Um, Just a frustrating game. It happens. You run into a good goalie. And Hellebuck is going to be, in my view, is going to be one of like the top five or six goalies in the NHL over the next five or six years. But I've, I've really liked him since... Like, he first started breaking into the league. You know what I realized today is that Kevin Sheveldayoff is still the GM in Winnipeg, and he's been the GM there since they since they relocated from Atlanta. So, I mean, this is, this is a guy who's, you can't, there's not too many GMs who've held their job as long as he has, much less been really the and only. He's, yeah, and he's done a great job. So. He has. No, like he's drafted extremely well. Like I don't know how you could draft any better than Winnipeg has. Their system is flush with talent. So, well, yeah, I, they're going to be a contending team eventually. Well, that's so, it. I mean, if you look at the roster they inherited from Atlanta, it was terrible. Oh yeah, it was uh, Brian Little and crap, <laughs> basically. 
And, and I, you know, they're not playoff quality yet, but they're on the upswing. And I think oh, Winnipeg's yeah. going to be a team to watch in the next couple of years. Yeah, like especially when guys like Kyle Connor get going and a few others in their system. They have a lot of pieces. And just like Calgary, like we have a lot of pieces too. Once they just start filtering in properly and get going, uh, they're going to be dangerous. And especially if they get another top 10 pick this year, whomever that guy is, that'll be another boost to the organization. So, yeah, I normally like any GM, you you think after three, four years, okay, time to move on. But Shevel Dayoff's done such a great job that honestly, until like, like unless Winnipeg struggles at, like in perpetuity like Edmonton which I don't see happening. But see I think then, that Winnipeg I mean they're not wedded to shovel day off. So if they start struggling, they've got the pieces, they'll just fire him and get somebody else. Yeah. Like I don't think they'll let him go down that road that Edmonton's at. No, but like that's the only way I could see them firing him at any point in the next like 5 6 years cuz He's doing a great job. So I can like, until they hit being... that plateau, where like where they can't get to that next level, then maybe you change it up. But for now, he's doing great. So just kind of let him rip. I can see this team being the next Anaheim Ducks, the big, fast, mean team to play against. They're getting the fast part down. I mean, if they keep getting guys like Wheeler and Bufflin, I think that they could have a, a makeup very similar to what we saw from Anaheim two, three years ago. Yeah, I agree. And uh, anytime you have a guy like Lene in there, you're not going to have any problems with scoring goals. Like, he's going to score 50 to 60 a year for probably the next five, six years, if not for longer. So, yeah, they're going to be a pain. <laughs> like, honestly, I think in like two years, you're looking at the Central Division champions and then for like, keep going. But and I think it'll be nice to have another rival there. Like, you know, we've got the big rival with Vancouver. We've got the big rival with Edmonton. And I think that as Winnipeg starts to get better, we're going to see that rivalry renewed as well. Mm -hmm. And that'd be a fun conference finals, Calgary-Winnipeg. Yeah, it would. Um, so, Matt, as of right now, as of the um, after the, Win the Winnipeg game, the Calgary Flames are currently sitting in the first wildcard spot in the West with 46 points. If we look at the Pacific Division, Edmonton has 49 and Anaheim and San Jose tied at 50. So we could theoretically leave this week first in the Pacific after the next three games. Yeah, doubtful though, but it's possible. Honestly, I think that what uh, looking at the four teams that are realistic playoff contenders that are outside the playoffs, Vancouver, they're not going anywhere. Dallas their goaltending is too bad their defense is too bad so realistically it's going to be a four-way dogfight between calgary la winnipeg and nashville and while nashville i think is better than what they've been like i could see them taking one of those spots so really it's just calgary winnipeg and la fighting for the the two wild card spots or one of the two wild card spots so yeah, and, uh, and it's, you know, we talked about this, how I think the Flames are going to be a benefactor of a weak division. And yeah. part of that is that, um, you know, you look at teams like Vancouver, you look at teams like Nashville, you look at teams even, you know, who've been, even Colorado, have done well in the past and aren't doing well this year, not only in the Pacific, but in the West as a whole. Um, I, I have no doubt that the Stanley Cup goes to the East this year. I think there's far more contenders in the East than there are the West. I'm not going to agree with you there. No? I think that there's a couple of teams that could win the Cup in the West. I think Minnesota, Chicago, and Anaheim could win if they get there. It's just, it would d largely depend on who they're facing, too. Like, it, you can always get upsets and all that kind of no, stuff. That's true. So, it depends. Like, if it's Pittsburgh versus, say, San Jose, like a rematch, then. Yeah, Pittsburgh's gonna win, but it just depends. Like every year, there it, there's one team that is ten, trends to be the favorite, and the other team not so much. And usually, the favorite ends up taking it. So we'll see. But I don't think 
Like, yeah, the East has better teams, but I don't think it's, like, that much of a separation between the two. Like, of the elite teams. Like, yeah, like say, like, once you get past, like, the third and fourth best teams in the each conference, then, yeah, there is a clear separation. The East is better. But, like, the top two in each conference, or three, are pretty much neck and neck with each other. Yeah, I'm I'm just glad the Flames are right now sitting in a playoff spot. They've worked hard to get here, and I think that if they keep playing the way they are, it's going to be tough to lose that spot. Yeah. Oh, I agree. And with the schedule being slightly more favorable until we hit March, the Flames have a better opportunity to cement themselves into a, a actual, like, one of the top three in the Pacific spots, but... Yeah, you know, still have a lot of games to be played. So, Matt, as of right now, we're at 43 games played, which is just over half. Like you said, still a lot of games to go. But some interesting numbers have come out, and a friend of the show, Ryan Pike, posted a really interesting article at Flames Nation this week looking at some of the Flames numbers so far this half. And some um, some really interesting interesting numbers here. So far, the Flames, if we look at their home record, they're 10-10-0. And their away record, they're 11, 8, and 2. So in the past, we've often said that the Flames have lost too much ground because of their away record. So it's nice to see that they're doing really well away. Yo, oh, for sure. And that go, especially if the Flames do make the playoffs, that will go a long way to help them win actual playoff series. Yeah, well, they'll like, probably end up being away for you know most of the playoff series. Or at least starting yeah, away. Like, only five teams in the NHL have more road victories than the Flames. The Rangers, the Bruins, the Blue Jackets of all teams, Edmonton and Minnesota. So, you know, they're doing good, at least, in that regard. Which is a far cry from years gone by. Ryan also broke down the Flames record by day. And it turns out the Flames are good in early to midweek and so-so on the weekends. They're 2-3-0 and in, on Sunday games, 2-1-1 one, and one on Mondays, 5-2-0 and oh on Tuesdays, 4-2-0 and oh on Wednesdays, 2-3-0 uh, and oh on Thursdays, Friday they're 4-4-0, four, four and, oh, and Saturdays they're 2-3-1. and one. So the best day for the Flames to play is Tuesdays. Yeah. We'll post a link so you guys can read all this. Um, same thing with their start times. If you look at their start times, and I won't read them all out, but... Um, they're so-so in early games, and they, they're pretty good when you get into late games. Uh, the later the start, the better the Flames record tends to be. The one that they're really bad at is 8.30 starts, and they're 1-2-0. and But, I mean, those are generally... generally Sharks or Anaheim, so... Well, that's it. If you're playing a late game, you've generally traveled a long way to play it, and the team's probably not feeling the best at that point. Yeah, and you're playing either San Jose or Anaheim, so it's like, yay, we're going to lose. <laughs> yeah, so, but, you know, if you look at the 5.30, um, 2.0-0, two, two, oh, oh, 6 o'clock, 2.0-0, oh, oh, 6.30, 3.2-0, oh, oh, so not bad when they're starting early. Yeah. Um, he also, and, and it's funny that, uh, you know, Ryan is a stats geek, for those that don't know him or read his articles. He even broke down which announced teams the Flames have played best for. So Rick Ball and Kelly Rudy were 16-6-0. Rick Ball and anybody else, because Ball always has somebody else with them when uh, Rudy's at the desk, 4-8-1, and one, and any other team were 1-4-1. and one. So we have to have Ball and Rudy. If we're going to be in the playoffs, it better be Ball and Rudy. Yeah. Um, I won't get into all these. I'll let you guys read through these on your own. We'll link them. But thanks for doing that breakdown, Ryan. Interesting stats as we look at the midpoint. Another midpoint evaluation that we wanted to do, Matt, and you and I talked about this before the show, was looking at some of the contracts. And I did a little bit of this with Mike uh, last last week. But the Flames have a ton of money coming off the books this year. A lot of contracts to re-sign. Um, thought it'd be good, based on where we're at now, to look at each one of these players and sort of figure out who we'd bring back and who we wouldn't. You up for that? For sure. Why Let's don't go. We, why don't we start with the unrestricted free agents? Um, Christopher Stieg. If it's less than uh, two million, sure. But I, 
he's doing a great job this year, but I'd rather spend on somebody that's not injury prone like Versteeg is. Because, like, each game, like, any time he's on the ice, I'm like, please don't get hurt, please don't get hurt, please don't get hurt. Because <laughs> while he's good, it's just... Yeah, I agree with it you. It seems like I... anybody breathes on him, and oh, crap. <laughs> I agree he's with out you, for a I week. think that's why at 950000 it works. Yeah. You know, like, if, if you're spending more than $2 million, then you're just basically replacing Ladislav Smead on the IR. Yeah, well, and I mean, if you look at a guy like, you know, Sta um, Boma, who's had some injury trouble, he's making 2.2. 2. So I don't think I'd sign Versteeg for much more than a million and a half just because he hasn't been healthy all season. No. You know, and I'd, I'd maybe do one year at a million and a half and say, if you can play 70 games, we'll talk about a bigger extension. Yeah, maybe if uh, I'm not sure if he's old enough in terms of being a veteran to have performance clauses in this contract. I think he'd be 35, don't you? Okay, yeah, well then, never mind. If he was 35, yeah. it's no wonder then, he's like, made a if glass. You play, yeah, if you play 70 games, then we'll give you like an extra million and yeah. a half. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure you got to be 35, but I'd have to double check. Yeah. Um, Dennis Weidman. No, not at all. Not even for the league minimum. You know what, he's... He, He's a. He's I'm had not a good week. Saying, I'm not saying that he's bad or done as an NHLer. It's just the Flames need to move on with his yeah. money and with his roster spot. Shillington or Anderson has to go into his spot. No, period. I agree. And he's had good flashes. Like he's looked good this week. Oh yeah. But he's not yeah. worth the five million. And like you said, he's aging. And yeah, I, I don't. I think he'll get an NHL job. Oh yeah, for sure. He'll. Th everybody needs a guy with a hard shot for their power play. I wouldn't so, be surprised if he ended up in Vegas. I wouldn't either. Um, but yeah, I don't think that he's the uh, right there's guy. There's always here. a use for a guy like Dennis Weidman. Not it's a five million not, bucks though. No, and honestly, I don't see him getting more than two and a half. But it, it's just that we don't need him. We've got. Brody, Hamilton, Giordano, Shillington, Anderson. We've got plenty of guys with bombs from the point. We don't need them. And, and I think if you want... We are one of the few teams that have that luxury that we can walk away from somebody like that and actually replace them with, from within. Yeah, and I think if you want just like a number seven veteran guy, sort of like they brought in, um, you know, they, they looked at that position a couple of years ago they've looked at it with guys like diaz and that sort of thing and um you know i think you can get that position a lot cheaper oh for sure if they just want a number seven veteran guy um i'm trying to remember who is that bum they brought in this year grossman that's right grossman i remember that he was kind of gross um yeah, like, you know, that kind of position you can get cheap and there's always those guys hanging around so if they just need a veteran guy don't call weidman back no what about uh, another defenseman who some people might say is being overpaid in Derek England? If uh, he wants to come back on a one- or two-year deal at the same dollar amount, sure. Because England is a, has ties to Vegas, I think we lose him. I think as oh, I, I, UFA he uh, signs in Vegas. Yeah, I think there's a 100% chance that he's a Golden Knight next year. Yeah. But if he wants to come back for $3 million a year... See, I'd have him back for a year or two. I've always the, thought he was overpaid. I wouldn't pay him $3 million again. I, I would. Um, we don't have... Like, unless the Flames can convince Carl Alsner to come here, the Flames don't have any physical, mean defensemen that can, like, actually drop the gloves if need be or shove people out of the crease. And, yeah, he's a little overpaid at $3 million. He's probably... it For what he brings is probably two and a half. But you have to pay the premium. And, you know, he, being a UFA, if he wants to come back, I don't. There, he, he, What he does on the ice, there's nothing offensive about his game. He just does what he's got to do. He, he chips in a little bit offensively, not too much, but he does what you need him to do. He's basically this era's Corey Sarich. And, yeah. you know, you, you re sign him. Yeah, you throw him out there, he'll play well, and you just focus on some other part of your defense. See, he's 34, and that's why I'd hesitate to sign him for more than a year, especially in a yeah. big dollar contract. I would not re-sign him before July 1, 
and I don't think no. he would. I think you let him go to July one. You see if there's any offers. If not, you throw him a, you know, a lower deal. But I'm I'm ninety eight percent sure that he probably, if not the first, one of the first Golden Knights. Yeah, I pretty much guarantee you. <laughs> like if I had to place money on it, because it being Vegas, placing money on it. Yeah, I had bet on England being a knight, but, you know, it, and, you know, he lives there, so it would make sense. One of the few players that does live in Vegas. Not only does he live there, he played for the ECHL team there. Like, he's just, he's part of that community, and you're always trying to get those guys in. And we've seen other expansion teams who've signed, like some of the Florida teams, who signed guys that weren't great, but they were the hometown guy. And I yeah. think that this is going to be, I think England will be a big piece of that team. I could yep. honestly see them putting the C on him for that reason. Yeah, so could I. Not arguing with you there at um, all. Next guy on the list, Brian Elliott. As of right now, no. I would try to find somebody else. Because you you got to figure that Vegas is going to get have plenty of goaltenders to choose from. So you could always just swing a deal with them. Say, hey, we like this guy. We'll give you this for that. And okay. So, or you could just deal with the team to get whichever goalie it is, whether it's like Howard or Mrazek or Flurry or, you know what I mean? Like, I can go through a whole laundry list or sign a guy like Bishop. Right now, Elliot's just doing okay. So, yeah, no need to bring him back. And I don't think he wants to be back. And what about just Chad because Johnson? It, him, yeah. I had. A uh, three-three deal would make sense. So right now, Johnson making one point seven, and Elliot's making um, two point five, and I think both those deals are very reasonable. Yeah, I I think if the plan, I think the Flames have to ask themselves what the plan is. If the plan is to go out and get another veteran goalie in the off season, then yeah, I would let Elliot go and bring Johnson back as the backup, maybe the one B, and get another veteran, but. If the plan is to bring someone like Gillies up, it might make sense to to bring Elliot back for a year or two at two point five, so that you do have yeah. the, the proven veteran for your young goalie. Honestly, if you're the plan is to have say Gillies come up, then I think you let both walk and so, get a more established guy, whether it's Howard or Flurry or Bishop, somebody, Mike Smith. Any of those are decent options. Uh, If you're wanting somebody to mentor Gillies, you'd have to go with the more proven guy. And honestly, Elliot and Johnson aren't that. So you let both of them go at this point. Yeah, if that is your plan to have Gillies. If you're planning on having a 1A, 1B with Johnson and new guy, then there are more options available. Yeah, I think, again, to me, it depends on what you plan to do. If you're going to go 1A, 1B, I might keep Johnson and sign somebody else um, but or trade for somebody else. But, yeah, if you want to go – to me, I think if you want to go with the kid, I think that um, I think that Elliot would not be uh, a bad choice. He wouldn't be a bad choice, but at that rate, I'd rather just go sign somebody else just because it, he's kind of not been very good this year, admittedly. Yeah, but we all, I mean, every player struggles from time to time. I think that I wouldn't sign him long term, but I might give him another year and see what he's doing. And and at under three, it's not going to hurt that much on the cap. Yeah. If anything, you might get a discount on him because of that. Yeah. I just don't know if he has much motivation to come back here either. So that's part of the. Well, I don't know. Didn't he say in the offseason that he and his wife were building a house here and all that sort of thing? Yeah. It hasn't been the best fit, so it, sometimes that matters more. I don't know. I would I would argue, I think that he got off to a bad start, but I think that he's the goalie the Flames need right now. I mean, yeah. it's not like he's letting the team down, but I don't think anybody expects he's going to take this team on his back and take us to a cup. No, well, it's one of those things that it, we don't have enough information. We still have 39 games worth of goaltending to evaluate, so... Like as of right now, so the body of work. Do so you is think your opinion great. might change if I asked you this in April? Yeah. 
Oh, okay. I I guarantee you, with the goaltending situation, that my answer is going to be completely different. Everybody else pretty much will be the exact same. Okay. Well, I will ask you that at the end of April. Yep. So those are our UFAs. Sounds like we'd both bring back most of them. Let's go to the RFAs. Remember that RFAs, the Flames, have the first right to qualify. Um, and then if they... If they do qualify them but can't sign them, they can get offer sheeted. Though none of these guys are probably going to get offer sheeted. Um, first one, I think, is an easy question, Sam Bennett. Of course. And honestly, with how he's played, I don't see him getting more than a 3-3, three, 3-3.5 three, three, three deal. Well, I think that the precedent's been set, too, by Goudreau Monahan of he can't go too high. So I think you're right. He's... He's still not exactly where they want him to be, I don't think. So I think he'll get a three, three and a half. I could even see, I can very easily see him getting a bridge deal. Well, I, that's what it, the three, three is to me, anyway. Oh, you're Just saying this. you're not saying three point three. You're saying three, three million for three years. Yeah. Okay. I thought you were saying like a three point three million dollar deal. Yeah, three years, three mil, three okay. and a half. Yeah, that would be a bridge range. deal. Yeah. So yeah, I think, and I think this deal is going to be done before july 1st like i think this is an easy deal to get yeah oh yeah and like especially with him trending towards the 40 point plus or minus five range three and a half is more or less correct for a player of his pedigree and all the factors around it so I don't see that being an overly complicated contract. No, I think it's it'll be pretty simple. We're not going to yeah. have a holdout till training camp like we did last year. Yeah, like I don't think it's going to be three and a quarter or four. It, it it'll figure itself out. Like it's, I'm not even concerned about that. Um, let's go through the the rest of these. Next one is one of the newest flames, Alex Chason. If it's less than a million, great. If not, eh, who cares? He's looked better than I thought he would this year. I think that. Oh, he's... I agree, but I wouldn't spend money on him. Like any more than a million dollars, I pass. We have guys that can fill in that spot. So. Well, that's what I was about to say too. He's looked better than I thought he would. I think that if they decide they don't want to to go forward with him, there might be some value moving him at the deadline, um, and his rights there, but. You're not going to get anything major for him. But, yeah, I think that you can pull one of four or five guys up from the farm and fill the same role. So even at under a million, I think the chase on will be gone. Yeah. Uh, Michael Furland. One and a half on yeah. a, like, two-year deal, something like that. Yeah, I think – I honestly think that Furland's money will end up replacing Boma's money. Um, but I think that you'll get Furland cheaper. Yeah. I agree. That's about right. Um. Next guy on the list, I know you're a big fan of, is Garnet Hathaway. Uh, honestly, like if I could, I'd say a four year at like one point two five, and lock him up for a long time at a cheap dollar amount, because the type of game he brings, he's gonna be a pain in the ass for everybody. Well, and that's and what it, the Flames want. The if you look at Calgary Flame style hockey. This guy exemplifies it. Like, I'm looking forward to Furland and Hathaway and Kachuk in a playoff series and just say, the coach saying, have fun. <laughs> yeah, I don't you know. think he's the kind of guy, realistically, you lock up long term. I think he's one of these guys that you give a two year deal and then another two year deal and then another two year well, deal. Uh, because of his age, I think he's only 23. Um, he's 24. 24. A four year deal. Uh, he has the benefit of the guaranteed contract, but if you're getting him for like a million and a quarter, you're basically locking in a high quality fourth line player for a long time, and you don't have to worry about like added costs in case he actually becomes more valuable than that. See, and I think because I, I think the Islanders did that with a number of their guys like uh, Matt Martin and that before, and it worked fairly well for them. Yeah, I I guess four years. Yeah, I could see. I wouldn't lock him up any more than that. And I no. think if you're going to do long term, you could probably get that dollar value down under a million. Well, even if it's like one point one or one point two, he's like, making seven seventy five now. I bet you'd get him for about nine fifty. Yeah, like on a one-year deal, yeah, nine fifty ish is about right. So you know, sometimes it's it makes sense to lock up 
less than like star players for a, a little longer term just because of the fact that like we saw with Bulma his contract exploded and his play declined because of injury so like if you can lock in a guy at, like Hathaway for like one and a quarter and say like he gets hurt in year two of that deal and is not the same player after that well you can just assign him to the farm and it's only really costing you three hundred thousand dollars on the cap so that's part of like the calculation instead of like boma where it's costing you like it would cost you like 1.3 million on the cap if you were to send him to the farm so that's where i'm i would extend him for a little longer than what would rationally make sense just for that cost certainty in that like fourth line right winger spot yeah i know what you're saying but at the same time i think that he's an easy role to replace oh i agree uh, it uh, i like him a lot obviously but we always but... like the tough guy i mean look at all the flames tough guys they're always well liked and yeah think... it's not just uh because of um him being tough he's smart wit in how he uses his physicality like he's not reckless or stupid <laughs> when it comes to engaging the other team so i think like he he and kachuk are like one and two in the nhl for drawing penalties per game like over 60 minutes of ice time so that's part of like the value there is that he's able to get under the other team's skin and like we saw that in the jets game where he, he had several guys like coming after him throughout the game yeah, I just I think you're right. He'll end up getting somewhere in the million plus range, but to me, I don't I don't think he's worth that necessarily to be a fourth line guy. I would like to see him get signed to less than a million. Oh, I well, yeah. I'd ideally I'd like to have everybody on cheap contracts. It's just you know, uh, sometimes you have to pay, and you know, if you're paying a slightly more giving it to a guy like Hathaway versus some other guys like say a chase on I'd rather go the Hathaway route but that's just me let's run through the rest of these names fairly quickly um Yoki Paka easy he's the number seven so yeah sure Kulak. a million bucks yeah Kulak eh, yeah I would re-sign him I think he... I'd re-sign him if I can get him on a two-way yeah, it, it, he has to show that like he can jump over Yoki Paka, and because one of these guys is going to be the number seven next year, and I don't know if you've got room to have one of them as they're playing right now as the number six. So they ha both of them have to show more in order to want to have both. Yeah, see, in I the can lineup full -time. I can see penciling in Yoki Paka as number seven next year especially if we're going to lose a couple of veterans. Um, if we assume that England will be gone, if we assume that Weidman will be gone, I think Kulak you bring back as the first call-up guy. I don't think he's necessarily earned a full-time NHL job yet. But I, I, I want him back. I think that there's still some life in him. Oh, for sure. And then if we look at some of our AHL guys, uh, Brandon Bolig. No. I think that Hathaway has outplayed him for the, his role. Yeah, I think uh, Bullock's just going to be an AHL wanderer for the rest of his career. If that. Yeah. Linden I Bay? Agree. If the AHL team wants him back, sure. Otherwise, no. I can see the Flames signing him in the same role he is now. Signed to a Flames yeah. contract for the AHL team. Yeah. Um, Ryan Culkin? No. Tyler Watherspoon? No. If it were me, I'd bring Culkin back. I wouldn't bring Watherspoon back. I think yeah. that, again, Culkin can be a fairly cheap veteran defenseman down there. Yeah, I think that uh, with the Flames having guys like Kanzig and uh, Hickey coming up and a handful of other guys like Olus Matson, like you're going to need spots. So, like, just kind of transition from the guys that haven't really done anything. 
Yeah, and I think, too, if we're moving some of these young players like a, an, an Anderson, like a Shillington up, there's going to be some holes on that blue line. And I think that some guys like Culkin can help to anchor that a little bit. Yeah. Well, in addition, you could just sign, like, random AHL veteran guy. Like, uh, sort of like how they had Colby Roback down there briefly and uh, Keith Ollie. So... Yeah, like, you don't necessarily need to keep your own guy. You can always fill, like, a veteran AHL spot with, like, an actual veteran AHLer as well. A guy you were high on when we first signed him, Kenny Morrison. No, not at all. I think he's like Van Brabrandt. He's kind of a failed experiment. Yeah, he had a great handful of games right off the bat where you thought he was, like, going to be something good. Like, he, he, in the AHL, he looked like TJ Brody down there. And then he just disappeared. And, like, you, unless you were reading the name on the back of the jersey, you wouldn't know it was the same guy. And he's never found his Not game again. Not uncommon for a college walk-on. No. It's just frustrating, because you see something in him, and it was a flash in the pan, and... And... And the, so, last, two, it the happens. last two names we have are our goaltenders, John Gillies and David Riddich. I don't even think I have to say anything there. You know, it's funny because we both. brought Riddich <laughs> in thinking this guy's going to be useless. He's just here to take up a an expansion draft spot. And he's actually turned in to be quite a serviceable AHL goalie. I know. I'm surprised at how, like, I look at his stats and it's like, whoa, where was that? Or, you know, like, when I saw him in person, it's like, eh you know, marginal AHL backup, and instead he's been extremely good. So it's like, okay, cool, awesome. You know, good for you, man. And bring them both back, see what they got next year. Gillies, I'm expecting, should get some games in the NHL next year, one way or the other. And Riddich probably won't, but you need, you know, you need to see what you got Well, if nothing else, I think having Riddich there... Makes it so that McDonald has a little bit more time to develop. You can either put Riddich yeah, in, exactly. in the ECHL and bring McDonald up if Gillies, you know, goes to the NHL for a bit, or vice versa. But I think that Riddich is a solid enough backup. And I mean, we've seen him. He got a shutout recently. Like the guy looks good. And even if you brought McDonald up for a bit, he didn't work well. You've got that solid backup. You know, you can go to. So I would bring back both of the goalies. Yep. And until such a time that Parsons needs a spot in professional hockey, you just kind of run with it. Oh, yeah. Well, I don't think yeah. – I think one of them, and I, it's going to be Riddich, I have no doubt, is not going to be a Flames prospect for the NHL. Like, I think he's – as soon as the next best guy comes along, he's disposable. Unless he shows more. And with goalies, who knows? So – like that's why you need to keep that pipeline of goalies coming because you never know. Riddich could end up being the best of all of them. Maybe he'll end up being the next Cause... Red Obara, who we end up trading for a second, and you know you never hear from him again. You never know, and that's the unusual thing with goaltenders. It's hard to determine with any of them. You just kind of have to keep throwing them in your system until somebody jumps out because eventually one of them will. It's just. It could be Nick Schneider for all it matters. Like, it, who knows? Like, it, it doesn't necessarily need to be the guy with the best pedigree. So, it, you know, you just see how they're doing. If they keep playing well, you just kind of like, okay, well, let's see if, you know, give him something more to chew on. And if he continues, then hey, great. And if, if nothing not, else, I mean, it looks like the Flames are planning for the Stockton team to be competitive. They're trying to ice a competitive team. And it makes me feel better about, you know, potentially not this year, but in the future, calling Gillies up, whether it's for full-time service or just to get a look and know that, okay, we've got a goalie who can hold down the fort in the A. Or if Gillies gets hurt again, which he has already this season, you're not like, oh, crap, uh, who's available? You know? Yeah, insert random six goalies like they did last year. Yeah, and I mean, even if you insert a random backup, you've got the guy who, you know, you can pull off the bench and he's ready to go. Yep. And it's not like going out and getting a Kevin Poulon just to fill the role. I mean, that's kind of what Riddich came in to be, but he's beating expectations, and that's awesome. Yep. 
So looking at the not only the midway evaluation of our free agents, Matt, but looking at the guys currently on the roster, there's a big thing that happens just after the midpoint every year, and that's the NHL All-Star Game. Um, we've seen some interesting things in the last couple of years. Last year we saw both Johnny Hockey and Mark Giordano go to the All-Star Game, and that was the year of the John Scott All-Star Game. If you were looking at Flames this year to go to the All-Star Game, who would you put forward as the Flames representative? Or representatives. There's only one name. Yeah, there's only one name on my list, and it's number eleven, Michael. Backlund. I would like to see Bax go. I think that'd be a great. I think that'd be a great thing for him at his age, at you know his age and where he's at in his career, to be acknowledged as the best player this year. Yeah, it, you could literally not ask any more from Michael Backlund than what he has given on the ice. He 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 deserves it, and. You know, Goudreau has not played well this year and was injured for part of it. And you know Goudreau's going to end up having like 15 All-Star games likely in his career if he stays healthy. So it'd be nice to see, like, if the Flames only have one representative, I'd like it to be Backlund just for that fact. Because it would be nice to see somebody that's not what one would think of as an All-Star being rewarded for with sure that i mean the media honor. pick would be johnny goudreau he's dynamic he's young oh for sure he's fun to watch um i think you're right if there's one guy who goes it'll be backland and it's a great reward for his season right now remember that goudreau is tied with backland for the scoring lead and he's done it in fewer games but goudreau just hasn't had the complete season that backland has yeah and like i'm expecting it just to be goudreau and maybe hamilton if or Hamilton, but you know, if it was me, that's There's so who I'd many like other good defensemen out there. I can't see Hamilton getting in. Yeah, I don't think he's had quite the season. I think he could do it next year if he keeps on this pace, but I don't think he's quite there yet. Yeah, um, and they generally tend to like to bring captains and established stars and that sort of thing. So I think that Hamilton might get skipped over for that reason. I agree. But, yeah, no, I, th I think it would be... A, and I think in the format that the All-Star game is in, the three-on-three -three tournament, I think Backlund would excel as well. Oh, yeah. He can... He's usually one of our best three-on-three -three players anyway. For sure. So, yeah, I think we're in agreement there. Backlund, I think if two guys could go, it, just looking realistically, it'd be Backlund Goudreau because the media would want Goudreau there. But, yeah, I yeah. think Backlund Goudreau would be a great flame showing. And... I think this might be the only time. I mean, hopefully there's more, but I think realistically this might be the only game Backlund might get into, so that'd be awesome. Too bad we can't yeah. take Backlund's whole line. Yeah, <laughs> just plop it in there and probably be the best three-on-three -three line, period, But because you got two forwards that play like defensemen and Kachuk who'll hit anything that moves. So was It, it must have been the mid-'90s. I remember back when I was a kid sometime, they used to have a Young Stars game. Yeah. And they don't really do that anymore. But that's where, and, you know, they've got this whole Team North America young thing. That's where I could see if they still did that, Kachuk cleaning up. Yeah. Like just going out there oh, and knocking everybody down at the Young Stars game. So there's, there's one more um, announcement from the Flames this week, and you could read as much into it as you want to, but if you... You know, I don't think there's much to read into it, but Watherspoon, who actually got a couple games in while he was here, no surprise, sent back to Stockton. And yeah, he needed to pass through waivers if he stayed any longer than he did, so they sent him down. And Kulak is back up. Um, Kulak, some people, if you talk to them, he's like the England whisperer. He seems to be the only guy that brings out the very best in Derek England, but this kind of brings our roster back to where we were at the beginning of the year, and Again, a sort of a failed tryout for Watherspoon, another sign that he's out the door. I have no problem with this. I think that really you're going to see... I, I think that you're going to see Kulak pretty much stay here for the rest of the year. Yeah. Well, you see that any time with teams and their prospects that are kind of waffling. It, they'll give them a shot like the Flames did with Nemitz and guys like uh, Chucko before. Let's see if they magically figure something out when they play the game or two in the NHL that they haven't really shown. But and I mean, Wilder's that way you don't have a good body way, to work on. 
yeah, I know. But you might as well throw him in there, see what you got. If he shows more than what he has, then, hey, maybe he deserves a second look. He didn't, so you can kind of, like, close the book on him and that's it. And just count down the days until the end of his contract. Or include him in a trade, depending. And just call it a day. Yeah, because he's an expiring deal, I don't know how much you're going to get for him. Well, it'd just be, like, a filler insert into a, a deal, like... Here's the main part of the deal, and then, oh, yeah, we include Watherspoon for some reason. Yeah, no, that that would make sense. I just don't think if you trade him on your own, on his own, you're going to get much. Yeah, it's like, say, like, just throwing hypotheticals, say the Flames acquire a Ginla for, like, a fourth-round pick and Watherspoon just so the contract's even out. Something like that. And, you know, I keep saying this this show, but there's another guy I can see ending up in the Las Vegas organization. He's a serviceable HL guy. They're going to need to fill 50 contracts or pretty close to it quickly. Yeah. I think that they could easily pick him up, you know, one, two years just to fill out a roster. Yep, I agree. You're not going to sign him six years, but one, two years, fill out a roster, and then send him on his way after that if he's not performing. Yeah, well, they're going to need some guys for, like, two or three years until, like, their first rounds of draft picks emerge because you got to remember not only they're trying to fill an nhl roster they've also got to fill an echl roster so these guys are going to be looking for probably 45 contracts quickly yeah oh yeah and it this is going to be a good year to be a free agent just due to that as long as you're there will be a job yeah there's going to be a job available somewhere so glenn cross probably wishes he was still in game shape yeah although he's been doing a decent job when he's been on sportsnet lately yeah, no, I, I like him there, but I think you can tell that his his passion is still with the game. Oh, yeah, for sure. So, Matt, looking at the Flames stuff that we've talked about, I th- think that one of the biggest stories coming out of the Flames for next year, and we're talking a lot about the players, but it's the new uniforms. We've announced that the uniforms are going to be changing. Adidas is going to be taking over. There's been a lot of speculation of if we go with a more classic look, if the Flames stay with a current look. I've seen this talked about almost as much as I have the free agents online by Flames fans. Um, Adidas made the announcement today that they're going to be dropping third jerseys for the first year. And there's been a lot of talk on this, but, you know, this is nothing new. If you remember back, the first year of RBK, nobody had a third jersey either. No. They want to sell the home jersey before they add more to the pool. Exactly. Like, if you throw three jerseys in there, then you're going to split the sales between the home and the third. That way, you're getting, like, an extra bonus set of money when you unveil the new third jerseys. So, yeah, what they want you to yeah. do, they want you to buy the home jersey in the first year. Everyone's going to have it. Then in the second or third or fourth year, they unveil a new one, and you buy that, too. Yeah, exactly. So this is not you know, a surprise. Their job is to make money. So, yeah, of course, you're not going to throw everything that you you have right from day one. Yeah, so to, It doesn't make any sense. So I've heard a lot of people talking about this, and I just wanted to address it on the show, because to me, I'm not surprised by this. This is the strategy I expected them to take. You start with yeah. two jerseys, and you add more later. Yeah. And, and it's not like every team's going to keep the same jersey that they have now. The, I'm expecting each team to with a couple of exceptions like Montreal to basically completely redo their jerseys. So just like we saw in the RB cage. Yeah, exactly. Hopefully no stupid vertical stripes for the flames, but you know, well, if, if some of the rumors are right, everyone's going to have the Adidas vertical stripe under the sort of, you know, under the arm on the side there, like we saw at the world cup, that Adidas logo, I don't know what you call it, but the vertical striping there. Yeah, Matt, would you be surprised if these jer- new jerseys... I mean, we know they're coming, but no one knows what we're looking at, and they're supposed to be there for next season. Would you be surprised if these are unveiled to us during the All-Star Weekend? No. That's when I'm expecting it, because it gives like fans time to, oh, this is cool, this is our new jersey, blah, blah, blah. So I wouldn't be surprised at all. No, and if I remember back, that's when I think... I'm trying to do the research here while we're on the air, but I think that's when they unveiled the RBK. They weren't selling them then, but they unveiled them to show everyone what was coming, and that way you could decide if you wanted one, if you wanted to buy it, um, you know, 
what and the team could kind of promote it. So I believe, if I remember back, they were actually like the New Jerseys were encased in ice or something at that All Star game. But yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm expecting these to be. I'd have to look. I have a picture somewhere of the Flames jersey encased in a block of ice. But I'm expecting that we'll see the first, even if it's not both jerseys. I expect we'll see the home jersey for each team unveiled at the All Star game. I agree. And it'll be interesting to see what happens there and what they look like. So, Matt, you weren't here last week, but we had your fill-in, Mike Gold, do your predictions for you. And as always, we'll end off the show with those. Uh, Looking back at last week, there were six points on the table. I thought the Flames were going to get four points, beating Colorado and Vancouver at home. And your fill-in, your pinch hitter, thought we were going to get five points. He thought we'd beat Colorado, Vancouver on the road, and we'd go to a shootout loss with Vancouver at home. So once again, it hasn't happened often, but once again, I managed to get this week right. And thankfully, it wasn't the inverse of what Mike picked. So that gives me a 5-1 lead this series. you got to catch up, man. Oh, I know. we got, what, a month and two months and a half left? Yeah, well, almost three months. I better go on a run then. There you go. You you got to start going on a run. You got to go on a Columbus Blue Jacket style run to win off this to win this season. Sixteen weeks in a row. Yeah. Uh, so this week we've got three games in the table. We have a home game against the San Jose Sharks on the eleventh. That's a seven thirty start time here at the Dome. Then we have the New Jersey Devils coming to visit and. That's on Friday night at the Dome, and that's a 7 o'clock start time. And then we start a back-to-back or a home-and-home series over two weeks where we visit Edmonton this Saturday, and next Saturday they come to us. So that's an 8 o'clock start time in Edmonton. So three games, San Jose, New Jersey, Edmonton. Matt, what do you think? Two points, New Jersey. You think that's the only one? Yep. San Jose is going to be tough, but you don't think we're going to beat Edmonton? No. Why not? McDavid <laughs> and Talbot. Talbot's hot right now, and Edmonton's yeah. doing good in general. Do you think the Oilers pick up McElhinney? He's on waivers. Tabasco's on waivers. I'm not sure. When I saw him on waivers, I kind of joked, yeah, they'll pick him up. And I was kind of joking, but honestly, they need the goaltender. And even if they want to waive him, you can option him back to where he came from, and you know, no one's going to want him back. No. So I wouldn't be surprised. I, I'm i going to see your New Jersey, and I'm going to raise you Edmonton. I think we're uh, going to go four points this week. I think we're going to win both. It's I don't think we're going to beat the San Jose Sharks. They're just too good a team this year. And it's tough to win a back-to-back, but the fact we have two decent goalies, I think we might be able to do it. And Edmonton, is they're still doing well, but they're falling a little bit. Yeah. Uh uh-huh. Works for me. So I'm going to go with... I, I've got the lead. Why not? I'll play dangerously. Um, if you catch up, great. I hope you're not right. But, yeah, I'm thinking that it's going to be New Jersey. And then we got a couple days off. And Well, hopefully... I'm hoping I'm not right. <laughs> so, you know. And then we got a couple days off. I'm hoping for four or six. So. Before, some more, before three more games. So we've got pretty much every week this this uh, month, the Flames play three three games. So three games every seven days, which is kind of interesting. So grab your tickets, go see San Jose or New Jersey, go to our, our friends at Tick Ticks and uh, grab some tickets. They should be good games. This is a fun team to watch now. You want to be at the Dome and watch this team. Well, Matt, I think that pretty much covers Flames news for this week. Uh, you have a good week. Enjoy these games, and hopefully we're going to have an, at least an Edmonton win because we've got to start beating the Oilers, and I will talk to you next week. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good week. Bye. This has been another Fireside Chat. Don't forget to subscribe to the show at firesidechat.ca. Follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash firesidechat. And to follow us on Twitter at Fireside Podcast. Catch our show on the podcast channel at thehockeywriters.com. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike License. Hosted by Dan Stevenson and Matt Dubor. Produced and edited by... Peter Marino and Ryan Coetz.